Good evening and welcome to Preparation Day. This is your weekly preparation for the upcoming Sunday. This Sunday we will be celebrating the sixth Sunday of Easter. And for us in the United States, this is Mother's Day. Let's begin with some prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you everybody who's listening to this right now, and everybody who will listen to it, that their uh, hopes and dreams may be fulfilled, and that they might come to know you more deeply through our discussion of, uh, of all these things. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is the second reading we're gonna, you're going to hear this weekend. But this is from... This is from 1 Peter 3, 15 through 18. Beloved, sanctify Christ as the Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks for a reason for your hope. To anyone who asks for a reason for your hope. But do not, but, oh my gosh, but do it with gentleness and reverence. Keeping your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who defame your good, car- good conduct in Christ may themselves be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be the will of God, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once, the, righteousness, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might lead you to God, put to death in the flesh. He was brought to life in the spirit. Okay, this is the second reading. I'm going to read it again just for brevity and clarity's sake. Sanctify. Christ as the Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks for a asks you for a reason for your hope. But do it with gentleness and reverence, keeping your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who defame you defame your good conduct in Christ may themselves be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be the will of God, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous that he might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, he was brought to life in the spirit. Okay. This is one of those passages that's, there's, there are many of them that just kind of stay in, in the back of my head. And I think about it, and I think about it with some regularity. And here's what I mean. St. Peter is saying, be ready, be ready, be ready. Be ready. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for the re- for a reason for your hope. Now, this is different than what Jesus talks about, where he says they will they will drag you before courts and Sanhedrins and and do not be worried about what you're going to say. Do not provide your own testimony. This is different because now he's saying when people ask you and uh, well, look, okay, I'm, I'm going to make a presumption. They're asking you sincerely. What is the reason for your hope? Why are you the way you are? And in fact, throughout time in history and people who have had conversions into Catholicism from other ways of life have often said we met Catholics and wondered what was different about these people than everybody else because they live something different. And here we get the, the, the Christian tradition of giving witness. I am ready. I mean, of course, the, the, the first giving witness is that of the martyrs that I give witness by my own blood. But the secondary way in which this is done is to give witness by my words for the hope I have in Jesus Christ. Now, this this is not an argument. This is not a lecture. I, I know I repeat this often. This is not a lofty ideal or an ethical choice. This is not about ethics. This is not about theology. What is your reason for hope? What, why do you believe? And I I can't stress this enough. I hear it, um, maybe not so much as I'm not speaking to high school students, um, in, 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 in these kinds of like open settings like I had in the past. Um, but, uh, although I I still do that quite a bit, um, you know, obviously with our high school students and I go back, back and visit E.D. White and Vanderbilt every, um, whenever I have the time. Um, but you know, I, in the back of my brain, it, it burns, and I say, well, the church teaches, and hear people say back, I, I don't know what the church. I don't care what the church teaches. I want to know what you believe. And of course, for me, I, I have two things I do. One, this this is what I believe, and two is to dig down deep and, and actually find the place where I believe it. Okay, what is the most solid and sincere I can be as I explain this? And and y'all do that too. Don't just tell people what they're supposed to believe. None of us, none, none of us is St. Paul. 
none of us is um, St. Augustine. They say St. Augustine would spontaneously make up his own Eucharistic prayers because he could do that. And St. Augustine during the week would just read and read and read and read and spontaneously get up and talk through his 30-minute homily. I don't do that. I'm not St. Augustine. But more importantly, you don't need to be. You do not need to be. Witness is very, very simple. What has God done in your life? St. Peter is making it really, really simple. What are the reasons for your hope? Why do you follow Jesus? Why do you? Yeah, sure. This is what you believe. I thoroughly believe everything the Catholic Church believes and professes to be true, what's taught in the Catechism, what's in the Bible, what's been taught through the living magisterium of the Church. I believe that. Sometimes without question. Because it's been right too many times to be wrong in other places. I've been wrong too many times to trust that I understand this better than a 2,000-year tradition. Now, does that mean that I have blind faith? No. Just, you know, once you get proven wrong enough, you, you start to not suspect you're smarter than the teacher anymore. Okay. Be ready to give witness explanation for your hope. But then he, he quantifies it because... There were jerks, religious jerks, even at St. Paul's time. But do it with gentleness and reverence. Again, this is not an argument. But he's giving you, his, his reasoning is, is unique and sneaky. And I like it because it is sneaky, okay? Not underhanded, not deceitful, not mean, but it's sneaky. You do this with a clear conscience. You be sincere. You be honest. In, in me... Um, I, I don't uh, I don't have good words to describe this because I haven't thought about or I haven't tried to articulate how it works in my mind. But um, all I can all I can describe it as is I look for a point of all I can see is like in an intellectual clarity or sharpness. Um, I, like this is it. This is what convinces me. And that's where I try and speak from. And whether it's to 4,000 people at a Steubenville conference or to 12 people in a small group or one-on-one -on -one in confession, that's the spot I try and come out of. Because, look, I'm not perfect. I don't, I don't always do what I should. I don't always do what's good. I don't always do what I know to be right. I don't learn every lesson I'm supposed to learn. Although, I'm, you know, in theory, I'm getting better at that. Although I, I had a, another experience not that long ago where... Um, you know, I had this gut feeling, and sometimes I write out, I, I just check on it. And I'm just making it up. It's just my imagination, right? No. I mean, it didn't go awful, but, like, the thing that I had the intuition was going to be a problem absolutely happened. And I'm sure you have those experiences, too. But, like, why don't I listen to, the, like, the whole point of, of living a life of virtue is that you can trust your instincts to do what is good and like, um, there was my prudence going, hey, we ought to check on this. And me going, hey, I'm really tired and would like to go to sleep. And I didn't. And, and the things, things, I mean, it didn't, didn't go badly, but things happened exactly the way I expected them to happen. And that could have been avoided. So St. Peter is saying, act with a clear conscience. Do it with sincerity. You're, you're not providing, St. Thomas talks about how you shouldn't use bad arguments. They might be convincing, but they're ultimately bad arguments. And when the bad argument is undermined, now you've, you've uh, rixed other people's faith because of your disingenuous argumentation. And again, let, let's be honest, this, this is not supposed to be about argumentation. It's supposed to be about who can argue with your experience. I mean, people try all the time, but this is what I experienced, right? And the whole point is be have a clear conscience so when they defame you and when they defile you, they themselves may be put to shame. Do what you are supposed to do. And you know, from the time I worked at the diocese, not that I made a big um, deal about this when I was there, but one of the things I always, 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 always tried to do was to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Presume... Uh, there's a there's a phrase going around the internet right now. Presume ignorance before malice, like a presuming ignorance, which sometimes means you say some things that you're fairly certain the pe person already knows. Uh, uh, I have no good examples right now without throwing anybody under the bus. But uh, actually, there was a gospel a few weeks back. I can remember if it was on the Sunday or weekday, where Jesus seemed to do this. He asked a question that he clearly knew the answer to, just to see what they'll say. And sometimes you got to do that. But what? Uh, I was like, look, 
I'm going to send every interdepartmental email, anything we, we commit to writing, every conversation, even though I am 95% certain that this person that we are talking about because we love them and we desire them to be better is going to find out exactly what they said. And it may not be flattering, but at least it'll be honest and sincere. Now, as you know, have my emails leaked? No. Have audio transcripts of my conversations at the diocese been available? God, I hope not. Not, not because they were deeply insulting, but, um, you know, the before and the after meeting, you know, there's, you've been at these meetings, right? You, you say a bunch of goofy things that not about the meeting, just hanging out, trying to be friends with the people around you. Uh, none of that came out, but I still operate as if it did, as if it was going to be. Just like, you know, they say you're supposed to on the internet, like if you post something to Facebook, or MySpace, MySpace, oh my God, show my age there. You publish something on the internet, on, an in, on a social media, that's public. And everybody sees it. And even if you take it down, it may not be actually taken down. People can still see it. I mean, the, 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 the websites have gotten better at actually deleting and blocking um, the stuff you choose to hide. But like, it, it's sometimes it's still there, right? Okay, so what does that mean? Um, as you talk with people, be totally honest with them um, about what's what's really going on in your heart. Somebody one time uh, was talking about, and I really don't know the context for this, but you're talking about um, the message of Christianity and, um, and and they were saying how it's it's un or it's dishonest to talk about Christianity in a positive in a purely positive light. Um, and not that Christianity isn't a, a positive thing, but that like if you only talk about all the good things that will happen because you follow Jesus, and not about the bad things that will happen because you follow Jesus, um, you've you've um, you haven't lied, but you've you've left out a significant piece of the whole story. And that may be true, but the, the, the presumption is also you're going to accompany this person, that it's not just, well, here's all the good things that will happen, and like, poof, there you disappeared the halfway across the globe. Although, again, there's stories in the Bible where that happens. Um, so what do you do? You stay with the person. Hey, this is what happens when you follow Jesus. And when things start to go rough, hey, that's, that's what happens when you follow Jesus. Uh, he told us that, that, that the world hated him and it was going to hate us too. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, let's continue on our little liturgy uh, deal that we've been doing these last few weeks. And I want to talk about liturgical imagination, which is going to sound really kooky, but it's actually really, really beautiful. Um, only be Maybe it is for me and not for you. You know, this again, this is like the sharpness thing in my mind. Like when I'm trying to really explain a point, I go to the most sincere place in my heart and I talk about that. And uh, boy, is it gratifying when you talk about a serious thing and you open your, and you, you, you look up for the, I look down while I'm talking. So as I'm thinking through the thing that I want to say, because I've pivoted and I've maybe gone off script and, and you look up and people are crying in the room. Like, you know, you've hit the sweet spot at that point. Not because you said awful things, but because you said things that strike the heart. Okay. That's what I look for, the sharpness. Here's what I mean by liturgical imagination. There is a, um, what's called a meme going around the internet. That's just a picture with words in front of it that says something funny. Um, and it's, a, um, the reason I'm not showing it to you is I'm struggling to find one that says the thing that I want to say and have it not be vulgar because the internet is plenty vulgar. The idea is, um, you know, you can go out and play your, uh, your sports or your video games. I'm going to go stare at slices of dead tree and hallucinate vividly for the next hour. And that's reading. And if you've ever read a novel that you've really gotten into, even just heard one, you... It's difficult to explain the kind of... like I expect my, my experience is different than, than a lot of people's, but maybe not unique from everybody. Um, you see it as much as you read it. Especially narrative. Like, um, I guess narrative is not the right word, but like novel. Um, like you're reading The Lord of the Rings. You're reading, um, I don't have a good, other good, C.S. Lewis, you're, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. Like you're reading fiction. You're reading story. Maybe not fiction, but story. And you see the story played out. You're reading maybe the uh, the Once and Future King, King Arthur is on my brain right now. Um, and you're, you're envisioning what it's like to sing King Arthur's Court. 
you are envisioning what it's like to see the the adventures and tales of Robin Hood, or you see the dragon in The Hobbit. Okay, that this, that's the kind of hallucinating that they're talking about, and it's super vivid for some people. For me, it's kind of vague, but it's it's amazing how like the words kind of disappear, and the images come. And, and, and uh, don't get me wrong, this is no like what Peter Jackson did in the Lord of the Rings movies is not what I envisioned with uh, when I read the Lord of the Rings. I mean, it, it, you could talk about it, it's kind of vague. Uh, you know, imagine like modern art. The modern art storytelling, um, stick figures. Like it's, there's really not a whole lot of detail on this thing. It's more like the events and what happens and oh, this is the turn and oh, who got stabbed in the back and ooh, what, what, that's the kind of stuff that r- r- rolls through my head. I could not have had the creativity to generate, um, you know, from. A, a, I want to mention a bunch of Marvel things right now, but like that doesn't work because Marvel's comic books and comic books have a graphic component. So like even before they made an Iron Man movie, they had an idea of what Iron Man looked like. And before they made a Captain America movie, they had, they had like, not only did they have an idea of what Captain America looked like, they had a very clear idea of what Captain America looked like. And if you deviate too much from it, you lose the whole thing. Okay. Well, in, in reading it, like if you can't, don't have this intuitive sense of imagination, the experience of reading, particularly fiction, is, is not going to be very edifying. Now, sad to say, that um, ability in me has been much broken by a lot of nonfiction reading. Uh, I don't want to say the seminary broke me of, of like the ability to read novels, but like I read a lot in the seminary, and a lot it was, it was all nonfiction. And so sometimes it's like to put down and this makes me sound way smarter and way more dedicated to my studies than I am, to put down the theology text and pick up a um, a novel, it, it, it seems almost like a waste of time, which I know it's not, but like try, you try convincing your subconscious to believe on what different than what it already believes. So here's what I mean by the imagination. Imagination is a power of the intellect and the soul in which we are able to conjure use images that we have already experienced out in reality to create new images that do not exist in reality. The artist does this. Now, the artist will do this, like, imagine a drawing. Sometimes they have an idea of what they want to do until they commit it to paper, and they start to see it, and then they go, huh, that's interesting. That's not really what I want. And then they'll take away some details and add different details. It gets fleshed out, but they already have this idea in their mind. And the, the thing has never existed before because by definition, the artist is putting together elements that do not exist out in the world so that they can create something new. This is in you. You may not be good at it. You may not be natural at it. But everybody has imagination. And you can be better at using this. From strategy to planning to leadership to business, to art, to nearly every facet of humanity, the capacity to visualize and use your imagination to your benefit is profound. It is a, will have a profound impact. Okay. That's imagination. It's, it's already in you. Now, here's what I mean by liturgical imagination. And when you read books on liturgy, and then you go see the liturgy. Even when you read books in the modern liturgy and you see the modern liturgy, you kind of sit there and go like, or at least I do. I'm going like, this is this is not really what I read. It, and it's not that what you read is not what's being played out. It's that it's, it's only so much it's fleshed out. You know, this is the difference between, say, an old Star Trek movie and a new Star Trek movie. I don't know why I picked that example, but like the, you know, the much maligned in, in, in cinema. But the capacity for animation and particularly computer-generated graphics means you no longer need to fake it. You no longer need to give the impression. You can just give, like, it's there. It's real. It's right in front of you. You can see it. Okay. In liturgy, it's not that fleshed out. You know, this is just between reading. Uh, liturgy is much more like a book or a stage play than a movie. 
so even when we talk about I know, I, not long ago I talked about um, Holy Week. Well, the Easter Vigil is much more dramatic in its description than it is in its execution. You could do it more dramatic, but there's still like limits. Because imagine if you were doing the Easter Vigil video movie, you would see the world spin into creation. You would see God come and create Adam and wrestle the forces of the world. You would see the exodus. You, know, you see clips of the exodus, right? We, we don't see that. We, we read from scriptures. And some of that has to happen in your mind. And when you have liturgical imagination, your mind fills in what reality cannot. I've only seen a handful of plays and musicals. You, you, you have to suspend your disbelief and enter into the play, into the musical. This is a terrible analysis, this is a terrible example, but it's the one that's in my head. Uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. You go watch that musical. That dude is not Joseph, right? That story is not even... The story is relatively accurate to the story as it appears in the book of Genesis, but not 100% active. So you have to supply what's missing in your mind, in your imagination. So this is what's missing. People can talk. You know, I don't experience this much. Although, you know, it's funny. You wear this out in public and people feel free to tell you all the things that they disliked about their church growing up. To which all I can ever respond in my, oh, thank you for sharing that with me. But in my mind, I'm going, hey, this is my bride. Could you? Uh, okay. Here's what's missing. People will say, I don't get much out of Mass. And I have two responses to this. The first is, and neither of which are you get, well, actually, you get into Mass, what you get out is about the second thing what I'm going to say. The first is, when you're not getting anything out of Mass, fine. Because it's not just about you. You are there as a member of the church to pray on behalf of the whole world. It's not just you watching a movie. You are participating in the great drama. And, you know, I saw a, a play, a version of, a, a rendition of Oliver Twist at the Terrebonne Municipal Auditorium, or whatever name they've given it now. And audience participation was a thing in between scenes. Did, did, was that really important? No. Would the play have been significantly changed without the audience participation? Probably not. Um, that brought some value to the people watching, but not not a ton, right? If it's in its absence, we would not have known that it was absent, right? If you're absent from the liturgy, that's that's a big deal because you're a player in the liturgy. We're really not. I'm really not supposed to say mass by myself, and really, you're not supposed to say mass with a single person um, either. It's really, I don't want to say frowned upon, but like it's not what the church envisions her liturgies to be. You all play a big role in the liturgy. Now, you get out of it what you put into it. People usually mean like what you prep for. Um, yeah, that's true to a certain extent. But what I want to focus on much more importantly is if you pay attention and allow your mind to ex not wander, but expand. Allow your mind to expand what is actually happening and fill in the gaps with what is taking place in the heavenly liturgy. You know, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, this is not a great example because we don't do this every weekend and we only, only pretty much do it during the Holy Week. Um, when the incense enters the church, that is supposed to be a representation of the Shekinah, the glory cloud. And it's not just this one little thurible, like putting out a little bit of smoke. Like you got to imagine the whole building wreathed in smoke and fire and lightning. That's what's symbolized. Now, there's a good reason why that don't happen. Probably slow us down. Our attendance would probably go down as people got freaked out week after week after week. But it would be harder. It would be easier to uh, to see what's actually happening. Imagine if when we prayed, uh, pray to the Lord that these gifts might be taken to your holy altar by the hands of your, by, uh, taken your altar on high by the hands of your holy angel. If there was a brilliant flash of light and thoop, 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 that happened. Well, imagine. That would, that would uh, again, there'd probably be some people freaked out. But if that happened, that would change a lot. That would change a tremendous amount. But it's not what happens. So your mind has to fill in what's missing. So here's what I try and do. No guarantee this is going to work. Um, most of the words I try and repeat in my mind, obviously I don't do this while I'm celebrating, although maybe I should pay more attention because I've frequently, more recently, been more and more and more distracted. And when I get distracted, 
Um, sometimes my autopilot's fantastic and just just keep going with the flow. And I realize after the fact, like, oh, man, I was distracted for a little bit there. And sometimes the whole thing comes to a screeching halt. And I go, I do not know what comes next because I don't know what came before it. And I look down at the pages of the book right in front of me. And I'm going, I'm not sure what I already did. And, 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 and I'd say this happened more frequently, but it is happening enough to where like, okay, I need to pay more attention now. But allow your mind to expand. What I say is I say the words to myself as I'm participating in the liturgy. I repeat them to myself. There's a, there's a constant dialogue. Because I notice I catch more. Um, and I, I suspect you'll, you'll do that too. Also, pay attention to what the words mean. And then you may want to watch a couple of, you know, we... I don't want to say rewatch all these things, but like um, watch a couple of videos on liturgy and learn yourself, uh, learn yourself something, teach yourself something, um, go learn something about liturgy. Um, and that's going to expand your capacity for this thing. Because imagine if you saw a play with no audio, it would be very good. Or you saw a musical that was just said instead of sung. It, it, it would sound kind of hokey because the whole thing would be an iambic pentameter. It would just sound the sing songy old time and that's what we do in liturgy sometimes when we don't use our imagination okay uh let's pray in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen heavenly father we give you thanks for all the many many blessings and benefits you've given us we want to ask you extend your blessing over our graduates and our moms we ask you lord to put your protection over our country our state um our church here in homo Tipito, and particularly christ the redeemer we ask you to um Give us extra vocations. Uh, be with us all who have listened, that we will grow close to you. Be with those who will go without, those who are ill, those who will die. We ask all these things in Christ our name, our Lord. Amen. Okay, y'all. Peace out.